Hi, everyone. Welcome. We are going to do a presentation for you today on Blackjack Murphy. So we've got Sandy Brumley in here and Josh. And with more information about this, I'm going to turn it over to Donovan Simmons, who is going to tell you a little bit more. Donovan? Thanks, Diane. Yeah, today we've got a presentation on the John Murphy lynching, uh, a 139-year-old cold case. This was originally presented on June the 14th, uh, but we weren't able to record it. And so we, we are recording it so we can get it onto a, a, a wider distribution onto YouTube. Um, Josh Grotstein and Sandy Bromley, uh, this is their third presentation to the Park City audience. Uh, their prior offers were Tom Kearns, Rags to Riches Minor, and the Park's Most Murderous Score a story about the 30 murders committed in Park City during its first 20 years. That's quite a, quite, a, quite, a, quite a bit to cover there, yeah. Both presentations are available on the Park City uh, Museum web, uh, YouTube page. John and Sandy met in 2017 uh, when Sandy moved to Park City, where Josh had been living since 2011. In New York City, they had both worked for various firms, including Citibank, where they nearly crossed paths. They both have MBAs, Josh from Harvard and Sandy from Columbia. But they ask the audience today, not please do not hold this against them. These days, Sandy is a peripatetic parkite. That's a, a bit of an alliteration there that I uh, tried to get through working in many capacities for PCMR, Park City Mountain Resort, on behalf of the museum. He is devoted to the understanding, preservation, and promulgation of historical heritage of Park City. Josh is the CFO of a New York-based medical organization and, fun fact, claims to have driven up and down uh, I-80 to, to and from Salt Lake over a thousand times. Sandy is an obsessive compulsive disorder, has an ob obsessive disorder, <laughs> excuse me. Sandy has an obsessive compulsive disorder related to Park City history. While Josh, who claims to have been kicked out of his native California long ago for talking too fast and not surfing well, is obsessed about story structure and storytelling. These character traits have led them to collaborate on a fictional television screenplay recounting events, events related to today's presentation. However, their lecture today is all about the evidence that Sandy's deep dives into Park City's history has unearthed and some of the logical speculation that has grown from that evidence. Okay, Sandy and Josh, take it away. Thank you so much, Donovan. Thank you so much, Diane. And it's a real pleasure to be here uh, again today to kind of a uh, go through what Sandy and I both feel is a really wonderfully compelling piece of uh, Park City lore and history. Uh, essentially, did Black Jack Murphy really do it? But to start out, um, there is a wonderful podcast that I highly recommend to those of you history buffs out there called Hardcore History by Dan Carlin. Uh, Dan Carlin is, himself is not a historian. He will tell you as much but he's probably read more books uh, on history than anyone that you'll ever meet and has one of the most wonderful podcasts recounting many uh, uh, epic uh, uh, events in history um, over the millennia. Uh, gets very deep into it, edit editorializes at times, but is very profound and very uh, in uh, insightful uh, and very compelling. And the reason I mention this is because when Dan talks about his podcast, he will tell you he's not a historian and it's fun to speculate about history, but that he always recommend, always reminds you he's not a historian. Well, Sandy and I are not historians, but we, like Dan, like to speculate about history and it's very fun to do so. And that's what we're going to do today with this presentation about did Black Jack Murphy really do it? Next slide. So, we have a gospel here in Park City that, that most of you know, that we hold these truths to be self-evident. Truth number one, Main Street restaurants are overpriced. Number two, traffic is getting worse and resort parking can be a mess despite the town's name, Park City. 
Uh, Baal is the evil empire, of course. So that's that's it doesn't have to be said. And number four, the fourth tenet of this uh, 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 four-part gospel is that Black Jack Murphy killed Matt Brennan. And for those of you who don't know, um, the, uh, those few of you who don't know what that means, let's go to a little video from the uh, museum that will show you a little bit more about Black Jack Murphy. Well, I got no hope of getting justice in this mining camp. The vigilantes will see to that. Well, back in August of 1883, I saw that old prospector, Matt Brennan, snooping around. So I shot him clean out of his saddle right at the bottom of Iron Canyon. But Brennan's dying words were, Black Jack Murphy done me in. The three men that heard him grabbed their guns and they ran up to my cabin. Well, I realized I didn't have a chance, and so, so I snuck out the back and turned myself in to the sheriff who locked me up in the county jail. Well, I reckoned I was safe there, but Park City's residents were in a rage, and as I was waiting in the jail for the judge to come, why, they, they kidnapped the train crew and fired up the engine, and they all came to Colville. Well, they all had guns, and my, my cowardly jailers, they, they turned me over to the, to the mob, and that's how I got back here in Park City. Well, them vigilantes, they never waited for a judge. They just gave me a trial of their own, and they, they found me guilty, and they sentenced me to hang by the neck until I was dead. So that is the story of Black Jack Murphy told uh, in a nutshell. Now, I, I have to say something before we move on and I turn it over to Sandy. Unfortunately, um, that is not Black Jack Murphy. Um, the reason we know that is twofold. First of all, um, they did not have video in 1883, so that couldn't have been him. And number two, Sandy, I look up, looked into it. He was, um, he, he, he was dead, so he couldn't speak like that. But so that's an actor. But thank that you, does thank you, Josh, story. for clarifying. We'll now turn it over to Sandy to tell the actual story of what happened that was recounted there. Sandy, all yours. So yeah, so uh, you know, a lot of uh, a lot of the facts we found related to the story come out of the newspapers of the time. Uh, here on this particular slide, we've got the the headline uh, shot from uh, the Park Record, which was the local Park City newspaper, and it's referring to a cowardly murder. Uh, this is the murder, or this is announcing the murder of Matt Brennan in the Friday edition of the newspaper. Uh, and, uh, you know, it's reporting uh, certain circumstantial details around uh, the, the murder of Brennan. There's, it's clear that he was murdered. Uh, there's also some speculation in the newspaper about who done it. Uh, and so a lot of what we heard uh, our actor just talking about uh, in terms of uh, you know, what happened, to, you know, for the Brennan murder, uh, that was as reported in this newspaper. So what was known to have occurred, uh, let's kind of look down uh, across the three days between uh, when uh, Brennan was killed and Murphy was hung for the deed. So on Wednesday morning, this is when Brennan is shot. Uh, it's in Thanes Canyon, right? If, if, if anybody here is a skier in, in the Park City Mountain Resort, it's right near the base of the Thanes Canyon chair. Uh, as reported in the newspaper, uh, Will Gorlinski and a guy named E.M. Wheeler uh, were on the scene. They take his dead body into town, claiming that he was shot. Um, Murphy appears later in town, um, so he's not sneaking away, uh, and, and he's arrested. Uh, and the, the local sheriff wisely takes him over to Colville uh, because there is no jail in Park City at that time. It's, uh, it's still just a mining camp. Town Hall has not been built. And so the only quote unquote safe place to lock him up is, is in Colville, about 30 miles away. Uh, so on Friday uh, that same week, uh, the, the, concert, or the, uh, the sheriff over in Colville, Sheriff Allison, he's getting nervous about what he's hearing coming out of Park City. Uh, and he actually takes uh, Murphy out into a field near the Weber River uh, for safer keeping. Um, for whatever reason, uh, by Saturday, um, he's, uh, he's decided that, that maybe things are calming down in Park City, and he brings Murphy back to Colville. Uh, that night, Saturday night, a highly organized team of, uh, uh, of 30 masked men from Park City hijack um, the Utah and Eastern Railway train. And they take it over to Colville. 
Uh, there's also a larger number here involved in Park City who secure the area around the Park City train station uh, so that uh, so that when this mob goes over to to uh, Colville to pick Murphy up and they come back, um, there's you know there's a safe environment for them to bring it back to. Uh, they break Murphy out of his jail cell. Anybody they find in Colville uh, who sees them and witnesses this event, uh, they lock him in the Colville jail uh, and they bring Murphy back to, to Park City by the same train. So it's estimated in the newspapers at the time that as many as 70 to 100 people were involved with this lynching. So Sunday morning, uh, Murphy is found hanging from a telegraph pole on Main Street. Um, with uh, a, note, a piece of notepaper shoved into his boot, uh, bearing the number 77. And as reported in the newspapers at the time, uh, it appears as though uh, the 77 has been written by 77 different hands. So uh, uh, so my personal interpretation is, ooh, this is kind of like the contract among, among the, the vigilante mob to, you know, to keep it a secret. And to you know to lay claim to to the justice that they've they've evoked. So what else was believed at the time? Um, kind of circumstantial evidence. Talk around the town, as reported in the newspaper newspapers. Um, it's reported that Murphy had visited the scene prior to Brennan's shooting. Um, Wheeler reported that as Brennan fell off his horse before he died, <laughs> Murphy killed me. Murphy killed me. This this is the quote. Uh, other circumstantial evidence from the newspaper, uh, Murphy owned a gun of a similar caliber uh, and that somehow people knew how many bullets he had and, and that, uh, that, it, that he was one bullet uh, down from, from his initial claim. Uh, so he, he'd fired a shot, uh, that there had allegedly been, uh, you know, uh, strong words exchanged between Brandon and Murphy when he came by for the visit. Uh, and then ultimately, that in general, Murphy was not a very well-liked guy, where, whereas uh, Brennan was. So how does that all shape up into a lynching? Well, let's, let's move on. Um, generally considered to be, uh, you know, an open and shut case. Uh, Josh, you want to take it? Well, yeah. So, so um, you know, basically it seemed like an open and shut case. On August 21st, Brennan is shot in the presence of witnesses. All witnesses named Blackjack Murphy as the assailant. Case closed. Next slide. Or was it? As it would say in Dateline. Next slide. Enter Sandy Brumley uh, in 2018. Sandy gets really interested in the history of what's going on this time in Park City and begins to do some investigations. Um, and, that, uh, and Sandy uh, will uh, tell you about some of those as we go forward. But um, on the next slide, um, some of the oddities and inconsistencies began to come to the, fl the floor here. And, uh, you know, obviously, again, this is all conjecture. We want to kind of re reinforce that. But there's some really interesting um, items that be began to kind of uh, uh, percolate in both uh, in terms of the, uh, the, the details that Sandy was finding and some of the speculations that he and I were making is just kind of uh, you know, just speculating of what could have happened. For example, how could Brennan have seen who shot him if the shooter was hidden in the bushes and at the same time, Brennan was shot in the back? So that was an odd one. You know, Brennan apparently said that uh, uh, Murphy shot him, but if he was facing the other way and the shooter was hidden, how was that possible? Secondly, why weren't there any other witnesses? The Crescent and Comstock Mine companies were very, very near and in full operation at the time. So one would assume with a loud report of a gun, there would be uh, certainly people in the vicinity that could have seen this and witnessed this. Um, and Murphy had uh, multiple partners. Why weren't uh, they there with him at the time? Second, uh, next, why were Wheeler and Gerlinski trusted and not challenged or considered suspects? In other words, they come down the hill they bring Brennan's uh, dead body. They claim that Brennan told them that Wheeler Dunn shot him in the back, uh, and they're and everyone goes on their word that basically uh, they were there and uh, they saw what happened, as opposed to asking the question as to maybe they had something to do with it or maybe they knew someone else that could have been there. Next, if Murphy was guilty, why did he show up in town after the shooting and not run away? It's reported that you know, Murphy actually just walks right into town. And if in fact he had just murdered someone, one would think that he might be on the lam 
or trying to do something to, to make sure that he's not uh, uh, taken in by the police. Yeah, Josh, and, if I could just jump in at this point too. Yeah. As, as you and I were talking about this, you know, back in the day when we first started looking at it, this was actually the question that you asked me that, that left me entirely stumped, right? Uh, if he was guilty, you know, why did he turn himself in, right? He didn't try to run. Uh, and, you know, the more I thought on it and slept on it, you know, this was, this was the thing that caused me to start to say, oh, maybe it wasn't open and shut. And, and then finally, um, why was there a rush to judgment without a trial? Um, you know, what's interesting, uh, going back in history, and, 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 and Sandy and I presented this earlier in another presentation, there had been a trial uh, um, of a uh, murder, of, of an alleged murder, um, of a murder, that, of an alleged murderer um, several years before. And the Par Park City had allowed the legal system to go forward. Um, and um, in that case, the, the fellow was caught after a long chase uh, by the by the uh, by the uh, by a police officer who happened to be the father of the fellow who had been killed, uh, he was brought back to Park City to, uh, for justice. He was tried, found guilty, but it, that that was overturned twice, and he was eventually let go on technicalities. So there had been precedent for a murderer uh, or murderers to have been tried uh, by the system within Park City. Why was it this case at this time? for the first time ever that they decided not to let the, the system run its course, but instead took it into their own hands in the town and lynched a man. Right, well, you can, you can also conjecture that uh, had that happened in our town when we were there, you know, we might feel frustrated, right? You know, we went through the legal process and here's a guy we all know is guilty, right? Um, but, uh, you know, in the, in the case of this other case, uh, you know, he, he's not, uh, you know, He's not brought to justice. Uh, so that would be kind of, you know, probably part of the rising tension in the town uh, related to this now current event with, uh, with Brennan and Murphy. Exactly. All yours, Sandy. All right, so uh, another interesting thing to learn about as you dig into Brennan's background is that he was a member of a secret society called the Oddfellows, uh, which was a very popular uh, organization uh, now, today, we call these organizations fraternal organizations, and there were many uh, at this time and throughout the history of Park City, uh, you know, the Masons, the Freemasons, um, there were various Irish groups, um, one that we're going to talk about a little bit more uh, as we go forward. Um, but in, in, in Brandon's case, he was a member of the Oddfellows, uh, and uh, he was a very popular member of the Oddfellows. So, so it, it is reported in the papers at the time that that in particular, one of the rushes to judgment was brought about by the Oddfellows. Their, their friend got killed, they wanted justice. And so they were uh, quite likely, although it's not known, uh, part of the organizing force that, uh, that, that drove to, to, to the lynching. So uh, at the time, uh, there were other people who, uh, who were actually in Murphy's Corner. Uh, it didn't happen until after the event. Uh, what we're looking at here is, uh, is what's called a uh, coffin notice, uh, and uh, it's, uh, it's done in the manner of the Molly Maguires, uh, which uh, were a secret society that goes back actually to Ireland in the 1840s. Um, they had some activities also in the United States, in Pennsylvania in the 1870s, and uh, this little coffin notice is very typical of the way they would announce themselves. Uh, you know, you've got that stylized coffin at the top. Uh, this was a notice that was actually posted on the door of, of John Moore, uh, who was the, uh, the town's uh, coroner. Uh, and what the notice is basically saying is, hey, you know, not everybody thinks Murphy did it. In fact, we think he didn't do it. Uh, as, the, as it says, you are hereby notified under the pain of death to absent yourselves without the least possible delay. This is a threat from the Molly Maguires to this list of gentlemen. Uh, you've got John Moore, who was the coroner. You've got Hank Clements, who was uh, the, uh, the town watchman. J.R. Lane was a miner. Truman Schenk, very prominent person in town. He was the president of the Comstock mine at that point. Uh, E.C. Williamson, a prominent druggist on, the, on Main Street. Uh, and then Joe Hughes and Bob Thomas, uh, 
Uh, these are both the guys that actually ran that train over to Colville. Colville. Joe Hughes was, quote unquote, the trainman or the conductor. Uh, Bob Thomas was the engineer. Uh, and so, you know, here stand this group, uh, you know, this, this thing is signed, the Molly Maguires. Uh, it's signed by a guy named, quote unquote, Captain Jack. Uh, and so, uh, you know, there are some guys in Murphy's Corner after the fact, right? This, this notice was posted, uh, you know, after Murphy had been hung uh, and was basically seeking retribution for Murphy's lynching. So what might have been Murphy's motives? So, yeah, so Murphy's uh, next slide, we could speculate again as to what his, some of his motives may have been. And, and we can do that based on some of the, the way he, he's been presented over history and particularly as in, in video, you know, uh, some would say he was a, he was a struggling ne'er-do-well uh, that was, uh, you know, he black hat, uh, bad, just a bad dude, uh, as we say, just an angry black dude um, or struggling. He, some say that he had a claim boundary dispute with Brennan, but Sandy will talk to that in a little bit, but there was some speculation as to that maybe was one of the motives. Uh, he had been a labor agitator of a sort uh, and um, years earlier, um, uh, uh, and there's some speculation that perhaps some of the higher ups, the, the, the Kearns the, uh, and uh, 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 of the world, oh, and some of you know, the folks in town who were running some of the mines at the time actually, would uh, have been maybe a little upset by having a labor agitator. Um, and maybe there was some issue with him because of that. Again, these are all speculation, but in general, I think the, the idea that comes down to us today is that this is a guy who wasn't very well liked. And, and, and that seemed to at least be what we thought was the case when we first were looking at this and as Sandy dug into this. And, and as you pointed out from the beginning, that just because he was not well liked doesn't make him guilty. Exactly. So how much credence should we should we give to this characterization of Murphy? Um, well, let's let's look a little bit more about what, what we can know about him. Um, just after he died, his brother came to town uh, and actually uh, looked into, uh, uh, you know, his assets. Um, you know, he uh, uh, he hired, um, uh, you know, some asset surveyors uh, and and basically um, you can find in the probate records um, this list of claims that Murphy owned. So uh, it's a little hard to read the handwriting, but basically we have a stack of different claims, uh, one of which at the very top is called the gem. Um, and that claim, uh, it, Murphy's portion of it, uh, he owned uh, like a quarter share of the claim. So his, his portion of it is worth 300 bucks. He's got several other claims, most of which have no value, some of which are assigned some value, but but his total net, you know, total assets, if you will, at the time of death, uh, were four hundred fifty thousand uh, dollars. No, so of course, uh, at the time of probate, uh, you're going to have to figure out well, who did he owe money to? Uh, and also in the files are are bills and and loans and other outstandings that exceed uh, this four hundred fifty dollars. So so he was not uh, a person who had a positive net worth. Uh, but he is certainly a person who was able to get loans from, uh, you know, from merchants and very respectable people. Uh, indeed, he had an outstanding loan from, uh, you know, from a guy named uh, uh, W.S. McCormick, uh, who was kind of like the investment banker of Park City in that era. Uh, it was a loan of $1,000. So this guy was a man who had some financial respect. Uh, you know, he was not a guy uh, who was a ne'er do well. Uh, Let's look a little more, more closely at, at where those claims actually lied. I've got a, a map here on the screen now uh, from 1882. It's the, the Gorlinsky map. Uh, and it shows uh, in this particular slide more broadly where Murphy's holdings fit in the town. You know, that's Thane's Canyon coming down the map there. And if we zoom in a little closer, we can actually read some of the claims. So, uh, and this is also a slide that shows you uh, the gem. It, it, as, as inside that circle there, that, that was the claim that he was actually working on the day of the shooting. Uh, the Comstock mine is right next to it. As we said earlier, it's an active mine. The Crescent Mine is just across the canyon uh, within visible sight. Down the, down the canyon a little bit is a mine called the, the Mini Wheeler. Uh, and, uh, 
And so uh, let's throw a little bit more detail into this exhibit by showing where Brennan's claims lie. Uh, they don't appear on the Gorlinsky map because he had just in previous weeks uh, stuck, you know, staked the claim. Uh, and so, uh, so clearly they are right next to each other. Uh, reported in the newspaper at the time, there were some boundary issues, but boundary issues are very, very easily resolved. You know, it's, it's all a matter of agreeing that all the stakes are correctly located. And so while uh, there may have been some disagreements at the time, by the time of the shooting, the, the claim lines had been laid out. So, so why, you know, where's the motive? Is the, is the question that I'm starting to raise in my own mind here. Why, why would Murphy feel threatened by Brennan and certainly feel threatened enough to shoot him? Okay, so we, we've looked at what might be or might not be some of the Mur uh, Murphy's uh, motives for uh, killing Brennan. Now let's think a little bit about what other people might have had as a motive potentially, speculatively, to have gone after Brennan or Murphy. Next slide. And in order for us to do this, we have to get into some very murky waters of um, mapping. And particularly, uh, we have to think about taking two-dimensional plots that Sandy just showed to you and really think about them in a three-dimensional plane. And this is before the era, long before the era of GPS, artificial intelligence, or any sort of mapping that we have today. But essentially, a lot of the rights that everyone had when they, when they staked a claim were on, uh, first were a two-dimensional uh, plot, but it went all the way into the mountain itself. And there's something called apex rights. And apex rights really describe how these three-dimensional rights interact with one another. And they could be the cause for a lot of consternation and conflict between different parties. Essentially, the law of the apex says that a minor of a claim which contains the apex may follow the vein uh, of uh, that's within that um, three-dimensional land um, out the sides of the, of the claim. If, you go, if you're going straight down, you could see that the, if the vein goes through your, that, that, that um, uh, funnel, if you will, or that cylinder, or, or that uh, uh, three-dimensional uh, parallelogram, if you will, if, it, if the vein comes through there, you can take it outside and continue it outside, but not through the end. Or, the, the original apex definition was such that where the ore protruded from the surface, and that was changed over time. Um, but, uh, and this all comes out of the 1872 Mining Claims Act. But in order to get at this a little more deeply, I'm going to turn it over to Sandy, and we have some maps here that might, might uh, begin to kind of play into it a little bit better. But it's a, it's a complex topic. Yeah, so here's here's a couple of maps. Um, just uh, drawn. Well, the one on the left is drawn from the internet. It actually, it looks a little bit like Thane's Canyon, and it's showing how it, an ore vein kind of tends to flow down a canyon. Uh, in this case, it's a, it's a specific location uh, and a specific ore vein. Um, and then on the right hand side of this slide, uh, we're showing this uh, this three dimensional concept that that uh, Josh is talking about. On the left, we have claim A. And it's an oblong claim in Park City. The claims were 200 feet wide by 1,500 feet long, uh, and uh, and then we've got a little drawing there of an ore vein going through claim A and into claim B. And then the general notion here is that uh, if claim A has the apex inside of it, uh, it's got superior rights to claim B. So. Let's, let's flip back now to our map and think about how that applies to these claims uh, that are in question between Murphy and Brennan. So uh, we're adding you know, a couple of other features to this, uh, this map that we were looking before. Uh, Thanes Canyon basically goes downhill from the gem toward Brennan's claims. Uh, and so, you know, if you think about how uh, uh, the, the two of them, and in particular how Murphy would have interpreted uh, that apex claim law, uh, uh, you know, I, if I were him, I'd feel pretty comfortable. I'm uphill, right? Uh, and there's there's uh, there's no reason to feel threatened by Brennan. Might feel threatened by the guys up in the Comstock mine because they're uphill for me. Uh, but uh, you know, in terms of what I'm working on, I'm just going to keep working my claim, try to find silver. Uh, if there's silver going out the side of the claim, I actually own the Denver. Uh, 
And if it goes into Russian Bear, which is owned by Brennan, that's okay. The, the, the claim law allows for that. Uh, so the question then becomes, well, who might feel threatened? Well, further on down the canyon is the Wheeler Group. Uh, and uh, it's, uh, uh, there's a, a mine called the Mini Wheeler Mine that was founded by J.S. Wheeler in August of 1883. So it's already a functioning mine at, you know, at the time of the shooting. And the question then arises, well, what's E.M. Wheeler's relation to J.S.? Uh, we really couldn't find anything in the historic record related to that. Um, but, uh, you know, it does seem that uh, there's cause for suspicion as to Wheeler's motives, uh, you know, related to, to these claims. So uh, we looked then a little more closely at, at who are Murphy's partners. Uh, it turns out there are these great old books that are kept in the Summit County Courthouse uh, that are from the time, right? So these are books that are filled out in pen and ink uh, that tell you who, uh, you know, located the claim uh, and, uh, and who were their business partners. And so what we find when we look at all of these claims that turn up on Murphy's probate is that uh, he was actually the locator, right? So he was the minor guy that was, that was figuring out, you know, where do we, where do we want to stake a claim? How are we going to follow up on it? Um, there's a guy named Michael Welch who appears to have been uh, his financial partner. Two other guys, Patrick Griffin, uh, Patrick Brennan, uh, and James Duffy, uh, you know, they all had uh, uh, shares of this claim. Uh, and then uh, as we think about uh, from there, who benefited from Murphy's death, um, what we see in the, in the paper record is uh, as of 1890, um, there's actually uh, some business activity between Truman Schenck, or one of the guys on, uh, on, the, on the Molly Maguire's notice, uh, and James Duffy, who's one of Murphy's partners. What, what happens uh, at that time in 1890 is that, uh, that Duffy had obtained Murphy's claim based on an unpaid labor bill, um, that Shank and Duffy uh, market the claim to investors, uh, and that ultimately the claim becomes part of the DNM Mining Company with James Mara as a partner to uh, Jim Duffy. So there are people benefiting from the absence of Murphy, uh, and at the same time, there's nobody really, you know, looking at those uh, at those Brennan claims, uh, you know, into the future. So this is actually a map of uh, a later date. It's the 1902 mine claim map that uh, that Gorlinski drew, and we can see inside that circle, which was formerly Murphy's Holdings, um, the holdings have been divided up. Uh, some of those claims were sold to the Silver Bell Mining Company. The others are being operated by this DNM mining company that uh, that its former partner set up, and the the three white claims there in the middle, those are the Brennan claims. Bothering to follow up on, doesn't seem like they're very sweet looking claims. So, uh, all of this, to my mind, you know, begins to to suggest that, uh, or at least at least a lot, it leads us to ask the question. What was Murphy's motive? Did Murphy have a motive uh, for killing Brennan? Or did, perhaps did somebody else have a, a better motive? And oh, before, more. But, but wait, there is more. <laughs> and uh, so next slide. Now, we've, we've mentioned the name Gorlinski twice. There, there's uh, a father and son. The Gorlinski father is a respectable man in town who's really the map maker, the cartographer, who has drawn some of these maps, the claims that we have, that Sandy has shown to you. So he's a, you know, a, a major well-known uh, 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 figure in town. His son is one of the two fellows who, as we mentioned earlier, along with Wheeler, brings Brennan's dead body off the mountain. Now, what we find interesting when you look at, there's a obituary notice from 1901 that st states that the, the younger Golinski, the one who brought um, uh, Brennan's body off the mountain with Wheeler, um, he basically uh, died in 1901 and had moved to Mexico, it turns out, before the end of 1883. Now, the murder takes place in August 1883. He leaves Park City and goes to Mexico, apparently never to return until his death. And yet he has a very, you know, well-respected father in town. He, there's, you know, is, there's some station here. You, you begin to wonder why would a fellow who was involved with something like this or anyone 
leave and not return. And, and so it, again, speculation, but it's a, a, an intriguing speculation. So let's talk a little bit about the Molly Maguires. Um, who were, were they? Uh, you know, here's a picture of some Molly Maguires in, uh, in Ireland uh, that are from period Irish newspapers. Uh, and another example of one of these coffin notices. Uh, and so, you know, the question that really is, is intriguing to, to Josh and I is, you know, these people, they posted this notice on the door. Uh, they claimed that uh, they were going to string up the, the people that lynch their brother, John Murphy, you know, why did they suddenly fall silent? What caused that to happen? Uh, and so, uh, you know, there's, uh, there's newspaper reporting at the time that, um, uh, you know, this, this gang, this uh, 77, there's not just this, uh, this single piece of paper that's, that has the term 77 on it. Uh, there were threats made um, in the town at the time by people who called themselves the 77, uh, you know, that people should be, be silent or suffer further retribution. So there was a lot of under the cover, uh, 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 you know, activity in the town um, that, uh, you know, that sought to silence this, uh, this supporting voice for John Murphy. So now let's let's take a reset like we you know when normally when you're watching a baseball or football game in the third or fourth quarter they reset and say how many timeouts are left and what the score is and what's you know what's going on let's reset uh, our story so far at, at least from a macro perspective and look at the mood in Park City or what it might have been what we can speculate the mood might have been in 1883 in that August uh, period. As we mentioned, there had been this prior murder, the, the ha, uh, well, welcome trials. Welcome was the, the fellow who was uh, uh, tried for the murder uh, that we talked about earlier. Uh, and, and there was the, the federal and state system. Uh, eventually, uh, he was let off on technicalities twice. So that, that, that didn't sit well, we believe, with the, the, the people of the park way back when who were seeking justice for one of their own being killed. At the same time now, Matt Brennan is just shot by Black Jack Murphy. And within that same time span, within that few days, uh, down in Salt Lake City, there is a precedent that occurs, a very interesting case where um, there is a fellow named Harvey, who uh, um, uh, an African-American, who gets into a fight and ends up shooting and killing a, a police officer named Bert. And he is then uh, taken by a mob in Salt Lake City and lynched. And that lynching occurs right in the midst of all of this um, uh, um, action and activity that's going on in Park City. So, you know, think about this. We have a, a, a potentially, we have a town that is a little uh, upset by the legal system from how it's handled the, the welcome trials before. We have a, um, uh, a murder of, uh, of a, uh, someone in town who's respected, Brennan. Um, and we have a, um, a, a precedent for a part of Utah taking the law into their own hands down in Salt Lake by lynching someone and not letting the, the judicial system run its course. So um, you, you, one begins to wonder, could, uh, could that have planted a seed in the um, minds of the, the Parkites at the time that maybe they too should take the law into their own hands? On August 25th, of 1883, two articles appear in the Park Mining Record. One is about the lynching down in Salt Lake, and one is about the murder of Matt Brennan. So again, speculation, but perhaps at that time, there was a confluence of mood and uh, uh, anger and a kind of a, an, uh, a, uh, a means, a new means by which the, the town could take justice into its own hands. Sandy? Right, it's a, as, as we said at the time we were looking at this, right? It's a powder keg. Right, the minute Brennan is, is shot, the powder keg is formed. Then there's this spark down in Salt Lake City, a murder lynching in, in a 20 minute period. Uh, it's all reported you know, between Wednesday and Sunday, or Wednesday and Saturday night, most importantly. So Saturday night, people have this information in their hands. They don't have to go to work in the mines in the morning, for drinking, uh, it's, it's a volatile situation. Uh, so, uh, Crazy rumor comes up after the events. Um, uh, this is how much people in the local uh, area speculated on things. This is a, an article from the, the Desiree News. The Desiree was the uh, basically the official paper of the Mormon Church. 
Uh, and this, uh, this crazy rumor is speculates that the same person that shot Marshall Burke uh, also shot Brennan. There's not a lot of basis in it, but, uh, you know, just what's, what's interesting, uh, you know, about this is that the speculation continues. Uh, the, the article further claims that the murderer was hired by Murphy. Um, however, the name of the accused in this article is not the same as the murder of Marshall Burt. So uh, another, another thing, you know, we find as we, as we use uh, old newspapers for reporting is that, uh, that their fact checking was, was not very resilient. So uh, clearly you can, you can toss this, uh, this follow up story off as a, uh, a crazy rumor, which it was as opposed to something really related to the case. And then in um, on the next slide, in 1920, um, we talked, we, we mentioned earlier the train, uh, the, the train that went up to Colville to get um, with uh, the folks from Park City who abducted uh, Murphy out of the jail cell in Colville, brought him back down. And that train was conducted by Bob Thomas, R.L. Bob Thomas. Uh, in 1920, um, years, years later, 37 years after the fact, he tells the park record that it was Brennan who threatened Murphy uh, and that Murphy fired in self-defense and that he stated that prominent people of the city took part in the hanging. So this is all new news that's coming out 37 years later. And it reminds one a little bit of uh, deep throat after the fact, after uh, 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 everyone's gone and Nixon's gone and et cetera, et cetera. Finally, uh, Mark felt basically telling everyone that he was deep throat and this is what actually happened. So one wonders if, if you know, Thomas could be um, lying, he could be trying to save his butt on, on certain things or just making something up or misremembering. But it was interesting to see that at this point in time, he had an alternative take on the story 37 years after the fact. And in fact, he was a, a player, if not a central one, in the, in the uh, abduction of Murphy from Colville. Right. It's fascinating. 37 years later, they're still talking, right? Yep. Oh, well, think of it this way. We're talking about it, and it's 140 years later. <laughs> <laughs> we'll continue the tradition. Yeah. So, uh, years. Yeah, so uh, uh, we're just uh, thinking here about... Uh, you know, was Blackjack Murphy innocent of the murder of Matt Brennan? Of course, there's no way we can establish that today. Um, but, uh, but, you know, what's clear is that at the time, there was no well thought out trial, no presentation of evidence, uh, chance for, for, uh, for Murphy to, to speak for himself in front of an impartial, impartial court of law. Uh, and, uh, you know, I think where, where Josh and I come down after having looked at this, uh, uh, repeatedly is that, you know, there's some, there's some cause for reasonable doubt. Uh, can we say definitively that Murphy didn't do it? No. Um, but we can, we can certainly speculate that there's, uh, there's a fair number of other people who, who actually benefited from the murder of Brennan, uh, who clearly were not Jack Murphy. He was gone. <laughs> and, and that, uh, you know, that there may have been others that had better motives. And so one could speculate again that um, along the lines of this, the famous book by Walter Van Tilburg Clark, The Oxbow Incident, which was turned into a wonderful movie with Henry Fonda uh, and Dana Andrews years later. And essentially, it's a story about a town that, um, uh, that where there's a, a, a crime committed, the town forms a posse, the town finds people on the road out in the, the desert near them. They uh, believe these people to be the... Um, the perpetrators of the crime, they lynch them and kill them only to find out after the fact that they lynched the wrong people and that they, uh, they because they found out that exa who exactly did do the crime. And so because they did not let justice do its course, because they did not you know, follow the law and took law into their own hands, they end up with the guilt on their hands for having killed people who were innocent. Now, again, speculation, but one could posit a alternative scenario whereby once upon a time in Park City, frustrated with what was perceived to be a weak and ineffective judicial system, the people of the park took the law into their own hands and enacted vigilante justice uh, that the entire town boiled over with rage. Uh, and then after that, they went silent and kept it to themselves, uh, omerta. Uh, they did not say a word about it. Uh, and they may have killed the wrong man. Now, again, this is speculation. This is our once upon a time in uh, Park City. 
uh, uh, narrative. But it's 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 fun, as Dan Carlin says, it's fun to speculate about these things, and we're not historians. Now, and um, actually, yeah. Josh, you know, if we were writing a screenplay about this, uh, wouldn't it be more interesting if the wrong man did get killed? Well, that would that's certainly what makes the uh, Oxbow incident work. <laughs> <laughs> So finally, on the next slide, and maybe the second to last slide, we, we know a few things. We know who shot JR, that's been solved. We know who killed Laura Palmer. I've been watching Twin Peaks again, and it's we, we, we actually do know who killed Laura Palmer. Kaiser Sose, also solved. But who killed Matt Brennan? Maybe that's unsolved. Who knows? What, and uh, the last one we'll leave you with is, what do you think? Um, based on what we've said, based on the information here, um, be curious to hear what you guys think. But for us, it's an intriguing thought experiment. But again, as we said throughout the presentation, it's all speculation. And that's what we have. Questions? Well, well thank you. Yeah. Um, first of all, I just want to congratulate you both on the level of detail that you put into this, uh, particularly Sandy. I know you spent a lot of time researching this, and there's a uh, there's a lot of lot of work gone into developing this story. Or, or well, that's that's my obsessive compulsive disorder. Right? Right. Yeah, I know all about that. Yeah, well, that's good. It benefits Park City and the history. It's uh, uh, um, but there's a couple of questions that came up at the time. Um, one of them was on the the seven 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 note. What was I mean? Was that a real? What was the sort of significance of that? Was that uh, what role did what word did that what did that play what role did that play if any? So uh, yeah, the you know the the newspaper reporting at the time, uh, several papers mentioned the existing of this existence of this funny little note paper. Uh, one of them went into considerably more detail than others, uh, and uh, it's it's funny. Uh, the first interpretation was that they, they held the piece of paper upside down and they thought it said LL at which they speculated stood for lynch law. Uh, but that was, uh, that was only one of the newspapers. Others, you know, correctly interpreted the 77. Uh, and there were follow-up conversations, right, about the, the mood of the park after the lynching. You know, how there were two competing camps, there were two schools of thought around who'd done it, uh, how the town was still, you know, quite a bit of a... Uh, uh, you know, a kettle on the boil and ready to explode, uh, and that uh, and that there was further action, if you will, further threats coming from a group uh, that called themselves the Seventy Seven. So, so it does appear that that it was more than just that piece of paper. That the piece of paper somehow represented the vigilante mob. Yeah. Okay. Another question I had is the the Odd Fellows group. You, it seemed from what you said that they were sort of the, the, the main force instigating or blaming, blaming Murphy for this. What, what was their sort of role in Park City at the time? Were they, were they this like a, a senior group uh, or was this a, a kind of more working men's group? Or how, how did they have such influence, I guess, to rile up the rest of the people that go after, go after Murphy? Good, good question. So, so at the time, uh, Park City was full of what were called secret societies. Uh, you know, Diane's familiar with them, I know, uh, as fraternal organizations, but, but in that era, they were called quite specifically secret societies. Uh, they banded together the different societies. They created uh, a building in town that was called Society Hall, which is where they would hold their chapter meetings. Uh, and so, so the Odd Fellows was one among probably ten or fifteen woodsmen of the America, the Freemasons, uh, and and like I guess like uh, fraternal organizations at college campuses, each one had sort of a, a different culture. Um, the Odd Fellows was one of the larger groups, uh, and clearly, uh, you know, Mr. Brennan was very popular amongst the Odd Fellows. Uh, you know, reading the tea leaves, thinking about uh, how the Molly Maguires came to bat for uh, uh, for for John Murphy. Uh, you know, he was apparently in that other group, and it and it kind of fits that uh, that notion of of uh, him being an agitator, him being seen as an agitator, uh, because indeed that's what the Molly Maguires were. They were a little bit more of a uh, a, a union workforce, right? Uh, 
and and they stood for stood against the oppression of Irish people in particular uh, by uh, farm owners and mine owners. And so, uh, you know, it would appear that these two guys were were in rival secret societies, uh, and uh, uh, you know, and it's certainly possible that uh, you know the odd fellows kind of whipped themselves into a lather, you know, between Wednesday and and Sunday, uh, and that he drove the process. One other uh, good uh, bit of fact that's from that era is that uh, on on Thursday night or Friday night, um, there was a uh, a wake held for Matt Brennan, uh, where uh, the Odd Fellows organized the event and the president of the Odd Fellows spoke, uh, you know, at his funeral. So, you know, another another perfect time for. Uh, you know, to, to, to envision that, uh, uh, you know, that this group of, of uh, brothers, uh, you know, got excited and, and wanted to, def- to avenge the death of their brother. Hey, Sandy. Oh, yep. just one question. Uh, what, just I, I had for you. Do you think the people who built Society Hall saw the irony in the fact that these were supposed to be secret societies? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, uh, I, would, I would think that you would not be building a Society Hall if you wanted to be secret, but I guess secret means something different back then. Well, it wasn't a secret that the societies existed. They had ads in the newspaper about their balls. Uh, okay. but, you know, so, so how does a secret society operate? It's, it's uh, uh, you know, it's got secrets in amongst its membership uh, that could be, you know, anything related to, you know, most of them, as, as Diane loves to point out, they, they had other, you know, good social causes, right? They founded insurance companies to take care of uh, their lives. Uh, you know, when someone from the Odd Fellows died, they would pass the hat and, uh, and, and, you know, give some money to the widow, you know, usually not enough to survive, but, you know, certainly enough to, you know, to sort of tide her over, uh, you know, with the loss of her husband. So uh, the operations that were secret were amongst the guys, uh, but they were quite public about the fact that the, the organizations existed. Got it. Another, another quick one. You, you, you sort of raised some suspicion about the younger Gorlinski, uh, I guess, going going off to Mexico shortly after. Was he? A, was he? A, do you know if he was a member of the Odd Fellows? Was sort of did that? Uh, 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 I, I don't, uh, I, okay. and I don't offhand know whether his father was either. Right? Like, like no, son, just, uh, they have been connected, but you know, I think the the main thing that, that Josh and I are looking at there is, you know, why would he leave town? So soon yeah. after the event, there's there's something suspicious about that. You know, you can't. That doesn't mean that he's guilty, but but he's he's left the country and he's hiding from something. It never comes back, as far as we can tell. There's what uh, the whole issue of the Apex uh, Law is, is it, uh, from a mining engineer standpoint, is a pretty complex one, and it led to all kinds of lawsuits, as you know. It would be good if I think you you mentioned. Possibly doing a field trip, Sandy, and explaining it actually uh, uh, in the field. That would, I think, that would be something that would be good to to do. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I, I pitched that to Diane today, uh, so so hopefully we'll we'll agree that this is something that's worth doing. Because then, uh, what I'm what I'm hoping folks might do is kind of kind of view this uh, this little uh, video presentation as background, and then let's go out to Thames Canyon. Let's look around. Let's find the gem claim. We can do it. We know where it is. Uh, and and it's a little easier, you know, when you're thinking about apex law and uphill downhill to stand in the real place, and to maybe maybe hear the spooks talk to you about, uh, you know, the, the the ghost of Matt Brennan maybe will will return to us then when we're, when we're there in the canyon. No, uh, Sandy, just just a little bit more on that uh, on those apex laws. If I have a claim that is uh, uphill, if my if my apex is uh, for that ore vein. If I have the apex of it, you know, going through my uh, uh, three-dimensional plot that I have, and, and you're further downhill, and, and, and the vein goes through you, uh, I have the right to apparently to uh, plumb that vein or mine that vein all the way into your plot, unless you've already mined it up up through you. So, I mean, uh, so, or so uh, is it kind of who gets there first in some cases? Well, yeah, and I, it, you know, you got to think there's probably a lot of drama by the guys that are digging and scratching out in the canyons, right? Um, they're uh, they've got their claim. If they can find silver inside their claim, that's theirs, uh, and so there's a race. Uh, so, 
uh, you know, what, uh, what ought Matt Brennan have done if his claim was junior to that of, of, uh, of uh, uh, John, John Murphy's, uh, you know, he should have raced in, tried to dig out the silver before Murphy got there. Uh, so, uh, you know, there are other great examples, uh, you know, in Park City history, a famous, uh, you know, uh, a mine claim suit uh, between the Mayflower and the Northland. Uh, this was how Tom Kearns, uh, you know, established his original claims. Uh, and, uh, and he actually won a lawsuit based on uh, the Apex claim. Uh, so it was something that was common knowledge from the era. It had to be something that all of these guys were thinking about. And when you, when you actually look at the array of claims that Murphy put together, uh, there's, a, there's a smart geometry to it right there. It's like a little herringbone pattern going down that canyon. And so if he finds something anywhere in that section of, of land that he's claimed, you know, he's got the great ability to just take it on down the canyon and dig up whatever he can find. So to my mind, a guy that's that smart, he's not going to, you know, blow it on, on, you know, getting angry at the guy that's got a junior claim. He, he's going to stick to his knitting. He's going to go back to his mine and, and, and keep digging, which is what he did that day. Sure. What we don't know is whether he or someone else pulled the trigger. Okay. Well, Josh and Sandy, thank you. Um, Great story, lots of intrigue, uh, lots of questions uh, raised, um, and uh, it's a, a good historical Western story that uh, is going to go on for a while, I think. And thanks for the, all the, again, all the work you've put into digging, digging up this information. Yeah. All right, well, thank you, Donovan and Diane, for uh, re-hosting this with us, and uh, let's hike up there and see what we can find. Yeah. <laughs> thank you, guys. That was wonderful. Thank you so much.